So next up we have Ellie Harrison, who's going to be talking about her art practice mixing data visualisation and politics. And I will let her explain exactly what that means. A big hand to Ellie, please. Thank you everyone and I also want to say a special thank you to Matt Locke for inviting me. I don't know how he found out about me, but thank you for finding out about me and inviting me here to speak. Um, and now I understand why everyone goes on about how amazing this event is. This is my first the story and it has been like really awe-inspiring so far and a, a, a huge number of incredibly hard acts to follow. So I'm going to do my best. Um, I first met Matt in October when we had a little meeting in London, and it was then that he gave me the very simple brief for today. The brief was that I had 20 minutes to tell you a story. Um, and the only thing that, the only specification that was that it had to be about something I'd made myself or about things that I'd done myself over the last few years. So I think this is a good brief to give to an artist because I often find that the best artist talks are those that are somewhat um, autobiographical or chronological even. The ones that um, tell a story which reveals where the artist's work is coming from, um, reveals how it's developed in relation to their own life's trajectory, but also how their work reflects the things that are going on in the world around them. So... Brace yourself, because uh, this is where my story starts. <laughs> so I was born in the London Borough of Ealing in 1979, just 54 days before this lovely lady was elected to power um, in May 1979. So this means that as much as it pains me to confess, I am one of Thatcher's children. I am a guinea pig. A social experiment, you could say. This is what happens when you grow up in suburbia under the intensive neoliberal programme of the 80s and 90s. This is what happens when you're born on the cusp of what Jeremy was talking about earlier, the dramatic transformation from a Fordist to a post-Fordist economy. Born into a world that is obsessed with selling services and information, rather than match manufacturing real, tangible things. This is what you become when you're taught that society doesn't matter, that other people don't matter, that it's survival of the fittest, and that all that's really important is your own career. This entrepreneurial ideology was central to my education, through school and through art school as well. I learned the skills of professional practice, as they call it, and I was indoctrinated into a way of behaving, a new ethical code, a new set of ideals, which is all incredibly scary. I know. Well, you'll be very pleased to know that over the last four years or so, I've undergone a bit of a cultural and a bit of a political awakening. I've woken up from the dream, and I've begun to research and reflect on the economic and political systems that have had such huge influence on my development, not only as an artist, but also as a human being. And I'm not sure if those things are totally mutually exclusive, um, yet to find out. So I've been attempting to come to terms with my history, with the shared history of our country, and to begin to expose and challenge the negative side effects that I see all around me now of rampant free market economics. But at the same time, I've also attempted to harness these entrepreneurial skills um, that I was taught and to reconfigure them so that they can be put to use for more positive ends than the simple bolstering of the ego which so many artists sadly seem to settle for. So now for a little more history. The infamous book this book, which was apparently stolen from outside, so I can only take that as a compliment. But if you should, <laughs> if you should feel the urge to give me £10 later, then that would be lovely. Um, so I used to collect data. I was a data collector, a number cruncher, a paper pusher, the perfect post-Fordist worker. Data was my commodity. It was my medium of choice. And it wasn't just any old data. 
It was my own data. It was personal data. I used to obsessively monitor and document different aspects of my everyday routine. It all began in 2001, uh, the year that I graduated from Nottingham Trent University with my fine art degree, and I began this project called Eat22. So, but looking back, perhaps I was obsessed with trying to quantify my own consumption in some way or take account of my footprint. I don't really think I actually knew what on earth I was doing at the time, but I decided on my 22nd birthday to take a picture of everything that I ate for a year. And alongside the 1,640 photographs that I took in that period, I kept a detailed log <laughs> of every single uh, time, date, food, and location of each photograph. And one thing led to another. And before I knew it, five whole years had passed. And in these five years, I'd undertaken several of these laborious year-long projects which included um, recording all the journeys I made on London transport over the course of a year, which, um, in order to calculate the total cumulative distance, which amounted to over 9,210 kilometres, which is the same as travelling from Ealing Broadway to Shanghai in a straight line. Um, and then also, in 2003, I completed one of these little daily quantification records every single day in order to extract <laughs> the magic numbers um, which would determine the specifications for a series of monthly sculptures. But this data collecting got more and more and more extreme to the point where in 2006 I attempted to record every single activity that I did 24 hours a day for an entire four weeks, making, in the process, a series of these colour-coded timelines, which I hope would offer a complete account of my whereabouts <laughs> and a definitive record of exactly how I was spending every single moment of my time. It's insane, I know that now, but this, like, um, <laughs> hence the book. Uh, it's like, it, this life tracking, which is so familiar to all of us, uh, just crept up on me. It had become an addiction, and in the process, it had driven me crazy. And I felt I had a duty to help other people I could see falling into similarly obsessive uh, habits. I had a duty to them, so it was time to confess all. I felt trapped, like I couldn't go anywhere or do anything without generating new data. <laughs> I felt like I was spending hours and hours each day just mind mindlessly administrating every single aspect of my own life onto these ever-expanding spreadsheets. But most importantly of all, I felt so focused on the minutiae of my own life that I was completely blinkered to what was going on in the world around me. I was blissfully unaware of these forces that had perhaps been the cause of my obsessive behaviour in the first place. So, the only answer to me was to quit. To quit data collecting and to go cold turkey. So this is what this book documents, the process of this period of reflection and rehabilitation which followed my decision to quit. I spent some time looking for ways to reinvent myself as an artist and to find a new direction. So I created this online self-help program which was designed <laughs> to train you to become the perfect artist. Please feel free to give it a go. I even launched an international campaign to try to find a collaborator who I hoped might be able to rescue me from the isolation that these totally solipsistic working methodologies had created, but to no avail. Then, fortunately, something happened. This is where I think it gets interesting. There was a global event and a local event that just happened by absolute sheer coincidence to occur on the exact same day. On the 15th of September, 2008, everything changed. 
This was the day that I packed up all of my worldly belongings into a van and headed up the M1 to start a new life in Scotland and to start a master's course at Glasgow School of Art. But it was also the day that Lehman Brothers Holdings, Inc., a bank in America that I'd never heard of until, until this day, filed for the single biggest bankruptcy in the history of the world, with $600 billion disappearing overnight, so they say. It was the end of an era. Not only was it the end of my cosy, heteronormative little life in England, but it was also the symbolic end of the entire neoliberal regime. This ideology that, as much as we may hate to admit, we'd all come to embody over the previous 30 years, was now finally falling apart. We were all back to square one. So, in Scotland, confused and scrabbling around in the dark, I thought about how I could best respond to this unprecedented period in history. So I began to research the past and to see if it would help me understand what on earth was going on. So desperately looking for patterns, as a recovering data collector is unfortunately prone to do, I began to visualise these histories. So first of all, I used a row of popcorn making machines to demonstrate the acceleration in the frequency of financial crises towards the end of the century. And then I choreographed a fireworks display to determine whether this had any correlation with the frequency of revolutions that had occurred during the modern age. This was 2010. The results are still slightly inconclusive, but obviously <laughs> it's been changed. Uh, it's, it, everything's changed uh, following on from the Arab Spring. Then, um, in an attempt to explore my fears, um, th fears about what the, the impact the economic crisis will inevi inevitably have on our day-to-day -day needs, on our basic abilities to get the food supplies that we need to survive, I created this vending machine, which is linked up to a BBC News RSS feed and programmed to only vend out packets of crisps when news about the recession comes up in the headlines. <laughs> Then, in 2010, as an exploration of the shortfalls in our liberal democratic system, um, I devised this all-night performance to visualise the incoming general election results through the medium of drunkenness. <laughs> this was webcast live throughout the night. It's still archived online. Uh, and it turned into what I can only say was quite a raucous musing on the intoxications of success and power. I'll leave you to investigate it yourself. But my plan was to use these playful strategies to engage and communicate my concerns with other people in the hope of exposing these sometimes invisible yet ever-powerful economic and political systems which govern all our daily lives. I also then began to use these honed administrative skills to coordinate projects which I hope would bring people together. Attempting to counteract the anxiety and isolation um, that heightened levels of competition create within the art world by launching the Artist Lottery Syndicate, an experiment which ran for a year. This is our total uh, winnings after investing nearly £8,000. <laughs> um, and then... Actively addressing the negative side effects caused by, um, well, our atomization as labourers in the new creative industries by running the Workathon for the Self Employed, which was a record setting attempt. Um, well, this was, we set the record for the greatest number of self employed people working together at the same space, in the same space at the same time over the course of a num normal nine to five day. That's 57 people in London last June. We broke the record to 70 in November in Newcastle. And then I've also been experimenting with other ways of redressing this life-work balance. As the new economy makes us all susceptible to working longer and longer hours. This is the desk chair parade, which I did in, in Manchester in 2009. 
followed by the Dust Chair Disco <laughs> last November, which I'm hoping there's going to be lots more of these in the future. But it often felt as though art was not enough, as though to work in a field of entertainment which is so closely linked to the production of commodities for a cynical marketplace was actually a huge ethical compromise. I felt I had a duty to try to iron out as many contradictions as I could to practice what I preached. In 2010, I became the self-proclaimed first individual visual artist to actively promote an environmental policy on my website, outlining the core principles which I attempted to live my life by, but also carry out my work. And last summer, after being... Um, well, in breach of my environmental policy, actually, and producing these signs uh, for Two Degrees Festival in London, I became overwhelmed by what I'm terming now as a guilt of production. Um, so this guilt spurred, on me, spurred me to launch a lifelong project, which I am now facilitator of, to ensure... <laughs> to ensure that these signs um, are able to remain on public display as signs that are promoting a cause, or at least jerking people out of their everyday uh, realities on the, on the high street, rather than becoming functionless objects in storage, or worse still, to become commodities. Arts venues and other organisations are now invited to adopt one of these four signs for a year-long period on the conditions that they look after them, and keep them on public display. So counter to the impulses of the capitalist system, this project and others that I'm currently developing have a focus on the long term. Because we all know that we should take responsibility for the things that we consume, because this is perhaps very sadly our only real power in the liberal democratic system. But also, as artists, it seems essential that we take responsibility for the things that we produce. Speaking of which, I have a small commercial break now because I have a vending machine which is in need of a home. This is currently at the Oriel Mostyn Gallery in Tlandudno and uh, it's going to be coming out on the 11th of March and there's nowhere for it to go next. It's been exhibited all around the country and if you're interested, same conditions as the, the venues that took the signs, just look after it and uh, put it on public display every now and again and it, it's yours, so get in touch. Um, but moving swiftly on... Um, <laughs> One thing I've learned over the last four years is the importance of continuing to retell the stories of the past. So that the values that we clearly once had are not forgotten. So last year I made this installation, A Brief History of Privatisation. Amidst the renewed attacks on the National Health Service and the last throes of the poor publicly owned postal system, it felt important to revisit the history of our gas, electricity, telecoms, post, rail and health provision. So I decided to use a circle of six electronic massage chairs, each representing these six key services, in order to make visceral... Um, this important story of public service policy. As a reminder, I'd hoped, of what it had been possible to create in the 1940s by acting on a moral imperative rather than an economic one. But more than anything, I've learned the importance of reaching beyond the restrictions of the art world and in investing time, resources, and my amazing administrative skills in real political action. And so I chose to coalesce my concerns for the environment, for the provision of public um, services, and for our increasing atomization as individuals in a complete passion for public transport. And in 2009, I launched the nationwide campaign to bring back British Rail, which I continue to run today. And now I find myself working with transport unions, with passenger groups, trying to find a way to revolutionise our failing privatised rail system so that it can be once again run for people rather than for profit. So, 
That's me in a, at a demo in August. And yesterday, I did meet Bob Crow, and that was quite terrifying, but also quite exciting. <laughs> So the, as this uh, installment of my story comes to an end, I'm continually aware of the push and pull that these multiple, the push and pull of these multiple roles and, and the different fields that I now find myself working in and the very competing motivations and desires of each of them. But like everything in life, it does seem like a huge balancing act. I've got to continually remind myself what I care about in order to attempt to operate with integrity, but always, and I found always, trying to retain a sense of playfulness, which I found seems to make everything seem possible. Thank you. <laughs>